Today we're going to look at a really interesting result involving residues of a complex function and infinite sums related to that complex valued function. But before we do that, we should probably recall what a residue is. So the residue of a function f of z at a complex number a is simply the coefficient of z minus a to the negative one in the so-called Laurent series expansion of the function, which can be written as follows. So we have the sum as n goes from negative capital N up to infinity of a sub n z minus a to the n. And these coefficients can be calculated via a formula, which I'll let you check out if you want to. It's similar to like the way that you calculate coefficients for a Taylor series. It's just a little bit different to take into account the fact that we've got these negative powers of z minus a. Okay, so in other words, this residue is simply a sub minus one in this expansion. Furthermore, I've written this starting at negative capital N, and we're assuming here that A sub negative capital N is not zero. So that means this sum really starts at that lowest point there. And in that case, we'll say that Z equals A is a so-called nth order singularity of F of Z. Okay. Now, there's actually a much easier way of calculating the residue, and that is by the following fact. So you can obviously prove this if you're taking a course in complex analysis, which I have a full one on the second channel, Math Majors, if you'd like to check out. There are, in fact, no ads on that channel because of Patreon support. If you'd like to support us in that endeavor, maybe consider it, if you can, of course. Okay, so the residue of F at A is equal to one over capital N minus one factorial times the limit as Z goes to A of, well, the capital N minus first derivative of Z minus A to the N times F of Z. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples. So the residue at Z equals zero of cosecant, let's recall cosecant is one over sine, can be calculated as, the limit as z goes to zero of z over sine of z. Given that z equals zero is a first order singularity of cosecant or the function one over sine. But that's a well-known limit from like a first semester calculus class and this is in fact equal to the number one. Now what about this? We've got the residue at z equals i of one over z squared plus one quantity squared. So, well, this is a second order singularity or second order pole, so we need to use the version of this formula up here where capital N equals two. So that'll give us the limit as z goes to i, and then we're taking the derivative with respect to z of z minus i squared times one over z squared plus one squared. Now, of course, we can factor z squared plus one because we're working over complex numbers here. And this, in fact, factors as z minus i squared times z plus i squared. So the z minus i's, like, obviously cancel, and that'll leave us the limit as, let's see, z approaches i of the derivative with respect to z of one over z plus i squared. Now, taking that derivative is fairly routine. That leaves us with the limit as z goes to i of negative two over z plus i cubed. Now, if you plug in z equals i, which you're totally allowed to just plug that in right now because there's no funny business going on, no zeros in the denominator, and you do a little of arithmetic, what you'll get here is the number negative i over four. And that's in fact the residue of, well, this function at z equals i. Okay, so now that we've reviewed some of this stuff, let's look at our main result for today. So now for the main result, and I should say here that this is a well-known result, but we're using the notation as well as the technique from something that I found on John Cook's website. You can check that out if you'd like to, it should be fairly easy to find. Okay, 
So let's suppose that f of z has finitely many isolated singularities and none of them are integers. So we're looking at a special case here. Furthermore, let's suppose that on a large enough circle, the modulus of f is less than some number m over the modulus of z to the k where k is bigger than one. Then the sum as n goes over all integers of f of n is equal to minus pi times the sum of all of the residues of the cotangent of pi z times f of z. Okay, great. So let's see how this works. So let's take some natural number n large enough so that the circle of radius capital N plus one encircles all of the singularities of our function f. So let's get that drawn on the board. Okay, so there we've got our picture on the board. So we've got a circle that's big enough so that it encircles all of the singularities, also known as poles of cotangent pi z times f of z. Now I'm gonna split those singularities into two types. First will be the poles of the cotangent function, and those are gonna occur at the integer values that are inside of this circle. In other words, minus n, minus n plus one, all the way up zero, one, two, up to n. And that's because cotangent is cosine over sine, and sine of pi z is gonna be equal to zero at all of those integer values, but those are gonna give us the poles. And then these pink circles will be all of the poles of f of z. And by our assumption here, we have no overlap. And now let's calculate the residue at, well, all of these yellow dots here. So let's observe the following. So we have the residue at z equals n of, let's see, pi times cotangent pi z times f of z is equal to, well, these are all gonna be simple or first order poles just given the construction we have here. So this is gonna be pi and then we'll have the limit as z goes to n of, Let's see, we have cosine pi z times f of z all over sine pi z. And I just noticed I missed something. We've got this z minus n term here. Now, via L'Hopital's rule, or really any method that you want, this isn't maybe that complicated of a calculation, what you'll see here is you get the value of f of n. Okay, nice. But now we can use the following formula. So we have the integral over this circle, so I'll call this circle gamma of n, of pi, which I'll bring out front, and then cotangent of pi times z times f of z dz, will be the sum of the residues at all of those poles. Well, that's not exactly right. It'll be two pi i times that. But let's move the two pi over and we'll have, let's see, minus i over two. And then, like I said, the sum of the residues at all of those poles. But notice the residues at the yellow poles are simply f of n. So that bit's gonna give us the sum as n goes from minus n up to n of f of n. And then the other bit will be the poles of f of z. But that bit can be expressed by this formula up here, but without the minus sign. So we have the sum over j, where that's counting all of the residues, of pi, I'll bring the pi out front, and then we'll have the residue at z equals a sub j, those are the poles, of cotangent of pi z times f of z. So that's what we have here. But now let's look at this object right here. And let's look at something involving its size. So let's bring that down here. And let's notice that if you take the integral over gamma of n of the modulus of cotangent of pi z times f of z, dz, 
Given this inequality that we've built here, that's actually pretty easy to bound above by something. And what you'll see is that this is bound above by the following. So we'll have two pi times m times capital N over n to the k. So let's see, the m over n to the k comes from this inequality that we're assuming, and then the two pi times n comes from the circumference of this circle right here. And I guess that should be two pi times n plus one because that's a circle of radius n plus one. But now let's notice that if we take the limit as capital N goes to infinity, this is gonna trend off towards zero because we assumed that k was bigger than one so that denominator is dominating the numerator. Okay, so that means that whole thing is gonna go off to zero but as n goes to infinity, this is going to change from going from minus n to n to going minus infinity to infinity. So really we have this object right here that I'm underlining in blue, which is the sum of all of those residues is equal to zero. But then taking that equation and solving for the sum over all of the integers of f of n will give us exactly this up here, which I have in magenta. Okay, so that's our big result for the video. Now let's look at an application. So for our application, we'll find the sum as n goes over all integers of one over z minus half squared. Okay, so we're gonna need a function to work with here, and the function is kind of obviously equal to f of z, which is one over z minus half squared. Oh, sorry, that should have been an n minus half squared. There, that makes more sense. So now, like I said, we're gonna work with this function. So notice that by this formula right here, it'll be the sum of the residues of cotangent times f of z. And that's gonna be at the singularities of f of z. So I think I said that in words, but let's maybe point that out here. So this is at singularities of f of z. Okay, great. So let's maybe note that f of z has exactly one pole or one singularity and it's a double pole at z equals half. So that means that this is gonna turn out to be minus pi times the residue at z equals half of cotangent of pi z over z minus half squared. Great. And again, that's by the theorem that we just proved. So let's see what we get here. This is gonna be minus pi and then the limit as z goes to half of the derivative with respect to z of, well, it'll end up being z minus half squared times this function right here. And that's by the formula that we listed as a fact earlier in the video. So that's gonna cancel this z minus half squared from the denominator and just leave us with the cotangent of pi z. So let's see, that's gonna give us minus pi, then we'll have the limit as z goes to half. That derivative there will give us a minus pi times the cosecant of pi z squared. That's just derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant, but then a pi pops out by the chain rule. But notice this minus sign and this minus sign will cancel, leaving us with a pi squared. And then notice if you plug z equals half in there, you get the cosecant of pi over two, but the cosecant of pi over two is one. You're squaring it, you still get one. So that means our final answer there is pi squared. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.